Good evening. Today we have a great opportunity to host uh, Rebecca O'Brien. She has been uh, uh, working as a producer since uh, more than eight, uh, 30 years now. Uh, she is running an independent film company together with Ken Loach, and uh, she's an associate director together with Paul Laverty. The company is called 16 Films. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here today. How how uh, how is the festival treating you so far? How have you seen uh, any good films? Or? I haven't seen anything. I got here uh, late last night, mm -hmm. and I have. I walked all the way up to the lady with the, with the sword and the bosom <laughs> on the mountain and, uh, and walked around the Mother Georgia. Mother Mother Georgia. Georgia. Yes. Anyway, I, walked to, I went to see her and so I, I've taken on to Disney. Okay. It's lovely and I'm very happy to be here. Really happy to be here. Okay, uh, so going to the producing directly. Uh, 30 years ago, when you just started producing, uh, it must have been probably quite different uh, from uh, producing today. How did you start producing? Uh, what were the challenges? Uh, was it something you could uh, learn at a university or somewhere, or did you have to learn that skill while you were working? I, I didn't know I wanted to be a producer. I didn't know that I could be a film producer. I, I, I'm a, a big film lover, and when I was uh, growing up, I, I used to go to the movies a lot, and but it never crossed my mind that I could be a film producer. A film producer is a, a large, a fat man with a big cigar and his feet on the table. I do put my feet on the table, but otherwise, uh, it was just beyond my imagination. Um, the first job I had in film was at a film festival, at the Edinburgh Film Festival, back in the late 70s. And I begged the woman who was running it to let me work for her. And after three years, she said, yes, you can come. And, and I, I, I had some money for the summer. And I said, I, I'm going to come and work for you for nothing. And, and she said, yes, you can come. So I did, and that was when I first started to meet film people. And film, and saw lots more interesting European films, you know this, and it really got me hooked. And I still didn't know I could do a job in film. I thought maybe I could be a script supervisor or something, because that seemed to be what the women did. I certainly, uh, and I didn't know how to get into film, but I was, I studied uh, geography at university and <coughs> economics. Well, that's locations and budgets, you see. And then, I worked in the theatre after I left university for a little bit, and I didn't like it much because it was all at night, and you didn't go outside much. So, I saw an advertisement for a one-week filmmaking course. So I gave up my job, and I went and I, I studied filmmaking for one week, and that was it. That was my epiphany. And uh, the people who ran that course invited me to work for them because obviously they found somebody who they needed to have work for them. And uh, I knew a lot, of, I had, because I built up contacts through the film festival, I did the film festival for three summers and then I worked in the theatre. I was working not, it was an art centre as well as a theatre and I was organising shows coming in. And so I, I, I met a lot of people, and um, they were trying to develop the film course. And I ended up, after a couple of weeks, teaching the film producing course. Um, so it was very short, uh, you know, it was it, it was a very short learning process. I, I did the course, and then I taught the course after a week. And it, it, it was just, the, the guy who was running the course had, had like, 20 lessons in film production. And because film production is just common sense, and I have a lot of common sense, it was easy. And anyway, after I worked for them for a few months, and, and while I was there, we made some terrible short films, really bad short films. Um, and then after that, uh, some people I met at the Edinburgh Film Festival invited me to work on a film that they were doing, a real film, and um, 
I was asked to be in production, and um, it was a very low budget film, but my job was production and um, <coughs> sort of location managing. And so that was really how I got into the business. And my real apprenticeship was after this film, uh, the first film I did, after that, I, I got to do, I worked on a, a kids' TV series for two years, and it was a magazine program, and it was all shot on film, and it was like, each, each program was like six little films, and there was some drama, there was working with real children, there was poetry, and different, we had to make a magazine program, and I did that for two years, and that was how I learned to make films, because we did everything. In that TV series, we did every possible thing that, you know, we made 200 short films in two years, so it, that's like how you really learn, when you just have to go out and make stuff. And then after that, I, I went freelance and I worked as a production manager or as a line, uh, uh, location manager. The location manager is the person who finds the locations and works with the director and the designer. So, and I did that, and this was in the 80s in, 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 uh, in Britain when Channel 4 had start, just started, and Channel 4 had a, a desire to make films, uh, lower budget films, but films that were for television but were also for the cinema. And it just started at the time I was available, I became on the scene. So I was so lucky because I got this fantastic opportunity to work on films with some great directors who were TV directors, but they were going to become film directors. So I worked on My Beautiful Laundrette, which was directed by Stephen Frears. And that was an amazing opportunity because uh, it was a crazy film. Uh, about uh, a gay Pakistani laundrette owner, and it was it was a successful film, and it was great fun to do it. But none of us had really worked in those roles before, so we were all learning on the job. So my early experience before I became a producer was all about learning how to do, how to get people out of difficult situations, how to park vehicles. How to change lavatory paper and empty rubbish. That's very, very important to training for producers. So you advise for young people to get practice. Get practice. Get get your in up very early, go home very late, <laughs> get bored. Um, when I when I was doing the, the my beautiful Andre, there's a lot of trains in the film. And, and one of the, my jobs was to sit on a tower block, on the top of a tower block, and, and watch and see, you know, if, if there's any good trains coming. Oh. Is this better? Yeah. Yes. That, that one's got sort of uh, special effects, like yeah. wind and rain. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, so, so anyway, yeah, I mean, it's a... And the other thing, the other thing about getting into producing was I, in my family there is a, an, organiza, an organizing gene. My mother was a good organizer, and I think I think it's very difficult to teach filmmaking uh, or film producing. It's, it's possible to teach other elements, but film producing, the key I think is to be a good organizer and to be able to manage difficult situations. Uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, sort of more about funding, but uh, mm, uh, remembering the wind that shaped the barley when you were making it. It was a uh, well, like many of your films are very political, and it was about Irish civil war. And I think when it was made, it was during the period when there were some tensions in Northern Ireland as well. Uh, was it like, did you have, did you struggle to get funding because of the topic uh, it touched, because of the political topic you were discussing in the film, or did you have any struggles with that? And if yes, 
what would you advise to people who are you know who are feeling strong about the idea and the feel that do but because of because of the problems they might be facing because of different things in terms of funding do do you do you advise them to to continue the job anyway or just give up <laughs> um actually it was the first film I did with Ken Loach, which was the film which was the politically complicated film. We wanted to do a film in the north of Ireland, a political thriller, best based on things that had really happened. So they were pol it was political, it was slightly, the, 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 the subject of the film was pretty true and dangerous, and it was difficult to raise the money at first. We, we tried, in fact it took Ken and I two or three years to get the film to happen. We, um, we, we, we went to a couple of British TV companies and asked for money and, and, and everybody liked the script, they thought it was good, but it got to the top of the organisation and they said no. And that happened on two or three occasions. We wanted to do this film but the powers at the top said they didn't dare to do it. Until we found, through a very, very strange route, we found a, a, a financier who was prepared to do it single-handedly. And he was a guy called John um, Hemming. Hemming. John, John Daly. John Daly, sorry. The, the company was called Hemdale. And uh, he was known for doing quite different sorts of films, and you wouldn't expect him to do a political thriller with Ken Loach. But he did do some political thrillers. He did a film called Salvador. And our, a woman who had been doing research for us in Ireland met him at a cocktail party and said, and he asked what she was doing. She said, oh, I'm working with Ken Loach. We're doing a political thriller. He said, oh, I'm a producer. I've done political thrillers. And she told me this story. And I said, well, who is it? And, and, and she said, well, John Daly. And he had a, quite a bad reputation for being a difficult customer. So I went to Eric Fellner, who was helping me produce this film, and said, why don't you try John Daly? And he said, oh no, you know, this is terrible, I'm going to have real problems. But he went to John Daly and John Daly said, yep, I'll fund it. And Eric had to mortgage his house and put his house on as a, as a uh, hostage, whatever. But we made the film, John Daly was as good as his word and gave us enough money to make it. So, he wanted to, he wasn't part of the British system. He was making new films his own way, and he was prepared to put two fingers up to the establishment to make a controversial thriller. And that's how we got it funded. So when we, when we later, when we made The Wind That Shakes the Barley, the way we did that was divide and rule. We had 21 different financiers on The Wind That Shakes the Barley. So not one dominant funder. And that was the way that we did fund quite a lot of our films. We did co-productions. But in the case of The Wind That Shakes the Barley, which is about the Irish Civil War and um, about the War of Independence from Britain, um, the way to fund that was to, to split them into lots and lots of bits of money. It was the most complicated bit of funding I have ever done. It nearly killed me. It was terrible. But it but we made the film. And that's the main thing. And I for me, funding is the least interesting part of producing. Um, it's a necessary evil. You have to have money to make a film. But it's 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 really boring because most of it is about contracts and legal things. Did you have the same problems? Was that like maybe hidden agent now? or it was a different story? Hidden Agenda was a different story because Hidden Agenda was one fund. Was John said, I'll pay for it. He had enough money. So he was like a studio. He could pay for the film to happen. So I didn't have to worry about the, the legal side. I mean, 
we had, well, obviously there were contracts, but that in a way was um, my co-producer, Eric Thelma, he had to worry more about making sure the money was okay. But it was more complicated. When I, the second film I did with Ken, which was Land and Freedom, uh, which was a film about the Spanish Civil War, that was the first time we did a co-production, and that was more that was the first time I did a more complicated financing setup. Um, but the thing about co-production, as I'm sure people here who, who've done co-productions will know, that when you've done it once, it's much easier to do it a second time. And then, you know, I think that the, the way co-productions are structured in Europe is really very beneficial and, 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 and good for, for uh, Producers, because you know you're you're what you know. You, if you choose a co-production partner you like, you have a good time when you see them, and you know it's it's like you have different friends in countries all over the place, and, and it becomes a pleasure. And different countries have a different ways of going about it. So I really enjoyed that particular way of of, of putting the money together. Um, it's it's strange because like other films that I've done where it has been one studio or one place giving you the money. In a way, you don't own it in the same, in the same way. They own it more. It's not your film so much as, as um, uh, the, the, the studio picture. And since you mentioned land and freedom, I want to ask you more, more of a political question. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I read somewhere that you said that it's, uh, the film is about the tragedy of uh, the left, because it's about the uh, civil war in Spain and about these different groups, the left groups who are discussing uh, how the land should be divided when they win the revolution. Uh, so, do, do, what do, you do, do you think that this tragedy, tragedy of left still, still exists? I mean, Globally, or in the UK, or I don't know. Do, and do, what do you think is the reason for behind this? Yeah, the the, 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 the story. Well, the, the way we tell, what we wanted, to, the story we wanted to tell in Land of Freedom was all about how how the left um, split into different factions because they had different ideas and and the ideological passion behind each idea and that was what tore Spain into pieces during the Civil War and so what we did the way we told the story was to to give different characters different ideologies within the left spectrum and um, and, and in a way doing that and, and that's what we did with the wind that shakes, shakes the barley as well you take a, you, if you it's a way of telling a big story on a small scale because you don't have the money to tell the story on the, on the big scale. So you, you make the characters representative of the different political movements. So that's what we did in both Land of Freedom and The Wind that Shakes the Barley. And it is indeed the tragedy of the left because the problem with the left, and it's still the case in Britain, and it's definitely the case in Britain because now we have, on the left, we have a socialist leader and um, the British have got so frightened of what socialism means because they've been, uh, they've, they've only experienced uh, soft left for the last 30 years. Since, since Margaret Thatcher came to power, Britain has only ever experienced a soft left opposition. And so to have, uh, and, and gradually, all the left-wing things, all the the, the the welfare state, all the all the things that were put in put into power from the, the first time we had a left-wing government in uh, after after the Second World War. So all the things that were put in place that, that were or weren't working have, have gradually been eroded over the last thirty years, and the Blair government. Uh, of the, the 90s and 2000s was not really a left-wing government, it was a central government. And the problem with 
having a left-wing government in Britain is that people have been uh, almost inoculated against it. They find it very difficult to come to terms with more socialist ideas. And even Jeremy Corbyn, if you look at a map of, of left and, and right, he's probably really somewhere in the middle. He's not very hard left at all, but it's looked upon in Britain as quite hard left because we haven't had that experience over recent years. The fact of the matter is it was history. These are true stories. You know, we, we do our research. The stories that we tell are based on reality. They're based on the truth. So uh, it's really weird. This, this uh, uh, British politician whose name is Michael Gove, who is in, in this, the current disastrous uh, conservative government, uh, wrote a, a horrible piece about the wind that shakes the barley. And uh, it was really surprising. The, the, the newspaper, the Sun newspaper, which is a, a tabloid newspaper in Britain, um, it also has a copy in Ireland. And in, in, in Britain, it said, how, how can this man hate his country so much? In Ireland, it said, hooray, palm door winner, the <laughs> winner shakes the barley. So it's the same issue, it's the same, you know, it's funny. Uh, so, uh, since you, uh, you, you, you touched the topic of research, I, I, I've heard that when I, Daniel Blake came out, a lot of people, like political opponents mainly, said that, uh, you know, the story might be good, but it's not, it's just a fiction, it's not, it's not the real life, uh, I've read it somewhere. And, uh, and then I read that there was a lot of research done when you were uh, uh, Working on this character of Daniel yeah. Blake, can you can you tell us more about uh, how did you do the research? What oh, and some examples of the, of the stories you found? Yeah, it's it's not so much me that does the research. The research is done largely by Paul Lanty, who does the writing. Um, but we all contribute to, to to it in some way. And everything in the film I Daniel Blake is based on the truth. And What's more is that what we discovered, uh, uh, in fact, I, Daniel Blake, is a light version of what actually happens. We found some much worse stories, but we were worried people wouldn't believe they were true. So when you turn, and I, Daniel Blake, is definitely a light version. Everything in that film is based on something that happened to somebody, and what I... What personally I found so horrifying about I, Daniel Blake and the story was that I thought that there were people like I, Daniel Blake, maybe one in 30, one in 20 people experienced this humiliation by the state. It's, it's, more like, it's more like 19 in 20. I mean, it's a consciously cruel uh, system. It, the, the government are well aware that they are putting people through really difficult hoops for them to get their money. They want to make it difficult so that it's difficult to get to claim the money. And it's cheating because they know that. And they even set targets in the job centers for people to turn people away. So they know that they need to make it difficult so that they don't have to give out too much money. And it's cheating. Why don't they just say, we haven't got enough money, and be honest about it, but then to make people do things that they can't. That, you know, if you try and fill in this form that Daniel Blake filled in, I mean, Dave, who plays the character, couldn't fill in the form. He just couldn't do it all. Uh, so everything that we do in all of our films is based on real stories, real people, and we fictionalize it and we dramatize it to make it palatable as a film, you know, um, and to entertain and to, to give people a story to, to follow. But, if, uh, you know, um, I think it was um, Damien Green, who's in a little bit of trouble at the moment, who's one of our, uh, who's deputy prime minister at the moment, he said, I don't need to see the film uh, to know that it's not true, you know, and it's it's wonderful when people say that because actually they're just advertising the film, and 
the film actually got a lot of mentions in, in Parliament, and um, Mary Black, who is a, 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 an SNP, a Scottish uh, MP, she used the film as the basis of a speech that she made, a beautiful speech that she made. So, and, and, and Corbyn actually challenged Mrs. May to go and see the film in the <laughs> question time. It's great. Did she see it? Of course she didn't see it. She doesn't need to see it to know it's not true. <laughs> um, yeah, speaking of uh, publicity and uh, advertising, do you think, what, do, what role do the awards, I mean, two of the films you worked with, uh, Ken Loach, uh, The Wind, The uh, Chape, The Barley, and uh, uh, Daniel Blake, they both won the main award at Cannes. Uh, what do you think is the, I mean, what would be the difference if they didn't win, uh, in terms of uh, bringing your ideas, your political ideas, to the wider public, do they, do they play a great role? We wouldn't enter into competition if, if, if it didn't mean something. It's actually, I mean, it's it's a strange thing that, you know, our our work is a competitive sport. We have to we have to go and, you know, you make the film and then you have to go and compete. It's a terrible thing to, to have to do, but that's the way it's decided that it works. But, I mean, we've been very lucky having won prizes and it does make a difference um, if you win a, if you even if you have your film in competition in can that will definitely for a f small film like ours because they're not big blockbusters they're they're relatively small films it makes it you know the attention that you get from being in, in such a public forum is very good for the film when you have if you have you know you have in Cannes, you have 2,000 people watching the premiere, and if, two, if you know if 1,500 people are weeping, then that's going to be good for the film, <laughs> as, long as, as long as they're not weeping because it's terrible. Um, but the the whole the whole sort of circus of that festival definitely, if you have a small film, it definitely gives it a big advantage because you just get so much free marketing and press you get you get so much editorial you get you know everybody talks about what films are going to be in the festival and when you're in the festival they're very excited about it um, before they've seen it and then they see it and they might hate it or they love it but they talk about it and the talking about it and all the articles is worth its weight in gold and if and it's made it meant for us it's meant that our best Territory is actually France. Uh, our films play much better in France than they do in, in Britain. Um, and it's given us an international audience being regulars at those sort of festivals. And I reckon also winning probably doubles the box office. Certainly is the case with both the Winter Chicks of Bali and I, Daniel Blake. Both of them have done really well. Uh, for the sort of films that they are, for political films, for, uh, you know, they, I think they, they, they've at least doubled the box office by, by being in that forum. Yeah, you said that there are um, more popular in France Ken Loach films than the films you worked on with Ken. Um, and I've read somewhere that, uh, I mean, your films are, um, many of them are about working class, working class uh, problems, for instance, My Name is Joe, uh, but uh, I have this, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not, again, it's more popular in France than in England. Do you think this is a case? And if yes, why, why do you have any questions why it might be true? It's, if, I wish I knew why the French like our film so much. I don't know, because if I knew, I would, I would put that in a bottle and <laughs> sell it. But um, I think the... It's, it's interesting, I was just talking to Christian earlier, the, um, uh, we've had a long history of, of these sort of films from when we were growing up watching British television. In the 60s, when I was a kid, there was a fantastic uh, TV series, uh, it was called Play for Today, or, or uh, the Wednesday Play, and they put these single dramas directed by people like Ken Loach and uh, fantastic 
the directed films for TV. And the British people watched these, and you only had like two or three channels. So you, most people, a lot of people watched these films. And one, one theory I have is that we've actually seen a lot of these things when we were young. And, and a lot of British people now don't want to see them now that they're older. And I think we've had a diet of good drama uh, in, in Britain of this sort. And I think the French don't have that sort of drama. So I think they like it because they don't have it. And maybe we've had enough of it. I think there is sort of maybe Ken, Ken Loach fatigue in Britain. But, but actually, having said that, what was interesting with I, Daniel Blake was that it really worked in the UK and it worked with young people. And I think they, that, that at last we might have reached a new generation of people. We're so old now. I mean, we've now reached a, a different generation, a more politicized generation. Because there's been a generation of people between me and the current young group that that have been brought up with Thatcher and Blair, who have been far less political. And now that whole, uh, that whole political ethos is in crisis. You know, a new generation of younger people are getting more politicized. And I think that the success of I, Daniel Blake has something to do with the fact that those people are going to see it. So it's interesting, you know, if you, if you make films for long enough, it goes around to the <laughs> Um, and I've been making them for long enough. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you've been working for, uh, with CAD for more than uh, 30, years. 30 years, yeah? So I assume you're very good friends with CAD. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so the question is, uh, um, is it, uh, what are the benefits or challenges of working with a friend? That's a good, very good question. It's great, it's wonderful to work with a team that you know. And um, Ken has very specific idiosyncratic practices. We shoot, the film is shot in, in uh, script order. Everything, the story is told, that the, the, the act, we, we don't show the script to the actors. The actors know what the story is going to be roughly, but they don't know what's going to happen to them. And uh, uh, they don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, thank you, Kimball. Oh, the, the, the actors don't know what's going to happen to them, so we don't give them the script. They, they, they learn about, they get a few pages at a time, and eventually, and, and the story unfolds for them. So um, we have these very peculiar pra practices, and filming in sequence, and um, keeping, using very long lenses, uh, keeping the set as empty of people as possible, no caravans, no circus. So it's a very specific way of working. And over the years, we've built up a team that, that, that we really that, that likes to work this way. And the advantage of working well with Ken and Paul, for instance, there are when you're when you're working with a new team, you have to learn how to work with these individual people. You have to make relationships with. The designer, the, uh, the camera person, the composer. Now, if you're working with the same people, there's so many conversations you don't have to have. So you can concentrate on the story. You can concentrate on telling. So there's a lot of wastage, wasted conversations you don't have to have. And when you're making a film with a new director and a new team, you have to start from scratch. You have to build that whole ethos and and that's where I really enjoy working with Ken because we're always talking about exactly what we're doing to tell this specific story we're finding the place for the story we're finding the the actors for the story and you can really concentrate so you you cut out half the work it's much easier and also from a financing point of view I've got regular people who I now work with, so it's much easier to raise the money. And so when you are, when you're making these films with the same team, it's easier. It's easier, and I and, and I, I can get quite lazy. Okay. <laughs> I think I think we should give a chance to the audience to ask questions if they do have some. There's a burning question. Somebody's got a burning question. <laughs> I 
think it's fair to say that Ken Loach is probably uh, Britain's most important director of the last half century with this uh, incredible body of work. Um, and it does fascinate me that you are able to make a Ken Loach film with 21 different partners if you choose to because the content of the films apart from one or two uh, and Freedom and Carla song when you've gone elsewhere uh, tend to be very culturally specific about British people living on the edges of society and so what is it that gives this international appeal to his films. Uh, I mean, this is very interesting theory you gave about Ken Loach fatigue in Britain, and <laughs> you and I watching Wednesday play as kids, but I think it must be more than that. Um, that there is something in those stories that has some kind of universal appeal, so that Green stories about people living on estates in, in English towns works in other countries. Yeah. Um, it, it, it really surprised me when I, Daniel Blake, worked in Japan. <laughs> I mean, why? We thought, we thought we were making a really small film. We thought we were making something very specific to the northeast of England, and perhaps our usual audience in France might like it. But we didn't know that the story would travel. But what I discovered was what made the story travel, the travel was that although it's about specific practices in the British system, those are reflected in every culture. Every culture has a state that isn't giving them enough money, and every culture has some form of state some form of state corruption, whether it's overt or underhand. And that's what people recognize. People recognize themselves because they also recognize the character who has been, who has been trying really hard in one way or another. They recognize the human endeavor. It, even if the story is, is alien, it's the human endeavor that they ident identify with. And I think it's about the individuals, and and something that Ken, uh, that I, uh, you know, one of the reasons why the casting and choosing choosing the right actors and having the right actors on screen, those people are really big on the screen. You know, your your head is really big on the screen, and if you if if it's not the right head, if it's not the right head saying the things that people empathize with or identify with, then you're not able to tell the story as well as you can. And I think people identify with the individual's plight, and I think that that's why the films travel. Because, you know, in theory, a detailed story about the Irish Civil War, you know, that goes into detail about the politics, isn't going to be something that necessarily is going to excite people, but if you if you put it in a beautiful landscape, which it was, and if you if you if you get the passion into the performances, and so all of our work, the way we film, the way we set things up, is about getting the best performances. Nothing else matters. The the you know when we when we when we you know the, the designer has to work. They have to make a set which is not going to steal the limelight. So, you know, it, it, with different sorts of films, you go along and you go for the, for the experience of, uh, you know, fantastic music or cinematography. And I love, I love a big epic film which has got, you know, wonderful sort of cinema ability. But we're not doing that with the Ken films. We're putting everything back. We're, so, the, so, you never see a red car in one of our films. The most difficult film for us to make uh, from a design point of view was looking for Eric with Eric Cantona because it's got, it's Manchester United which has a red strip. So everybody has these red shirts on. I, I, I wouldn't be in a Ken Loach film in this outfit because I've, 
cause too much attention to my, <laughs> too much color. So everything is stripped back. This, you know, the rooms aren't gray, but the rooms are muted so that, that the scenery isn't, you know, it might, it, Ireland was always a problem because it's so green. So you want to mute everything down so that the performances stand out, that the actual story stands out. So all of those things are very carefully done. And it frustrates us that none of our uh, technicians that we work with ever win prizes themselves because they've actually done a lot of work to get the cinematography right, to focus on the characters. The lighting is really important. The background is really important. Just so that it disappears, which is, which is a sort of strange thing. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, can I ask you a short one? <clears throat> yeah, following on from that, um, it, it seems to me that he never uses established stars. And so the first part is, is, is that true and why not? And the second part is, am I right in thinking he doesn't like close-ups? Okay, so, well, we have used, I mean, Killian Murphy was becoming an established star when we used him. And um, Bobby Carlyle wasn't a star when he did Riff Raff. He was more of a star when he did Carla's song. Mm -hmm. So he was an actor that Ken really liked and wanted to use again. And Peter Mullen wasn't a star when he did um, My Name Is Joe. It made him a star because, and it, just, it you know, there have been actors who have been made more of a star because they've been in, in a Ken Loach film, but. Um, the, the thing is, we want the audience to believe the person, that the person is, is the character and not Gillian Murphy in a film. We want, that's, it's, it's on purpose, we don't cast stars because we don't, I mean, I think it, it was very strange when we were casting Bread and Roses, which is an American film we did, um, we had lots of stars queuing up to meet Ken because they knew who he was. He didn't know who they were. <laughs> and so we had, I think, we had Keanu Reeves, we had David Schwimmer, we had Adrian Brody. They all came along to the auditions. Um, Ken had clue, it was great. And um, he cast the person he thought was right for the role. And he cast the person he thinks is closest to the role. So you want an actor with energy. And so someone like Peter Muller in My Name is Joe is a fantastic actor. And Ken had spotted him in an earlier uh, film. He had a small role in uh, Riff Raff, actually. Mm -hmm. And Ken thought, I'd love to do something with him. Um, but, and like, you know, Dave Johns, who is Daniel in I, Daniel Blake, he's a, he's a, a stand-up comic. He's had a, a career as a stand-up comic, but not as an actor. So we wanted to cast somebody who wasn't known in that world, so so that the audience really identified with him, rather than seeing, you know, Tom Hanks playing Daniel Blake. Would would you know you'd be watching Tom Hanks and seeing how well he could play this character? You know, it's not that's that's the way we work. What was the other thing we said? Close ups. Close ups. Well, we, we we're quite close on the long lens. You can, on, the, on a long lens, you're actually, the, the faces are quite close up. They're not exactly close up. We don't really do close up. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would like to know uh, what kind of themes you and Ken Lodge are not uh, always in common, and when you are working together, uh, maybe you could uh, remember some episodes when you were... When we disagree. Disagree, uh, because uh, right now you said that uh, uh, on casting came uh, Adrian Brody and Keanu Reeves, and maybe for you it was a bit uh, uh, <laughs> pain painful, <laughs> yeah, this decision. Well, in, a, in the end, actually, Adrian Brody was in that film. Adrian Brody was the main actor in that film, so it wasn't that painful a decision. But uh, yes, it's slightly frustrating because you know that there could be a good actor that's not going to get the part, and they could raise the money. 
But on the other hand, over the year, I had that problem maybe a bit earlier on. But when we did Hidden Agenda, we, we had an American actor imposed on us. We were told when we, by John Daly we had to have an actor that the Americans had heard of, otherwise he wouldn't pay for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Luckily, that actor was Frances McDormand, who wasn't very famous at the time, but she was good enough. And she didn't know who Ken was, but she was doing a film with uh, Liam Neeson, who said to her, you have to work with Ken Loach, you have to work with Ken Loach. So luckily, we got her. And she, so, yeah, we, the thing is with Ken, when we disagree, what happens is, I think I've got a better idea. So I'll say to Ken, look, why don't we do it this way? We can do something like this. And he sort of thinks about it and dismisses it. Three days later, it comes back as his idea. Then I know I've succeeded. So, so if the idea is to see the idea, and then if it's a good idea, it will come back. So I just, I've learned to be patient. <laughs> like fish. Exactly, exactly like fish. I think we'll have a question. Uh, hi. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding a film from this year. I uh, saw so that you were, uh, you participated in the, in the production. Uh, you were never really here, right? Uh, well, I wanted to know uh, how did you get involved in, in the production of this film. But I don't know if anybody here saw it, <laughs> but uh, yeah. you could tell us. Yeah, the Lynn, the Lynn Ramsey film um, that was uh, um, that wasn't finished by the time it went to Cannes. It wasn't quite finished, and uh, it won, I think, two prizes. It got best screenplay and best actor. Um, I I wasn't really supposed to be involved in that film at all, but. The production company, why not, is my French partner, and they needed a British co-producer. So I became the British co-producer, and we, the film was made in America, but Lynn is British, and um, uh, also to, make, to get some extra money, we needed to spend money in Britain, so we, we post-produced it in Britain, and we did, so we did the music and the post-production, and we um, and and what we did was about a month. We, we we found out that we were going to Cannes. We we weren't planning to go to Cannes, but we we my my French co-producer sent it to Cannes secretly, and they said they wanted it. So suddenly we were going to Cannes, and we hadn't finished it. I mean, we seriously hadn't finished it, and we had some flashbacks to shoot. So we shot. My job was to shoot a scene which is set in Afghanistan. There's, a flash, there's some flashbacks in the film. There's a scene in Afghanistan. There's a scene uh, in a, the back of a lorry. There are some dead people in the back of a lorry in New York. And there's also um, a scene in, in the water in, in the lake. Those three scenes haven't been shot. So we shot them all in London in three days and we, <laughs> my job was to make that happen really quickly because the film was going to Cannes. So that was my involvement in that film. I, got, I did the flashbacks and I was very proud of, of shooting Afghanistan in, on, a, on, on a beach near London. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Oh, is it your, your first film? Yeah, it's a continue. I, I, I think Lynn's an extraordinary filmmaker because I thought, when I first saw You Were Never Really Here, um, without any music and without any sound, I thought it was a terrible film. And then I saw it at the London Film Festival, finished, and I was just knocked out by it. It's, it's an astonishing film. It's really powerful. But um, uh, Lynn would be quite a handful to work with. But I, I enjoyed the few days we did together. I don't know if I'd be good enough to be able to do a whole film with her, though. <laughs> She's quite scary. <laughs> Mind you, Ken's quite scary, I suppose. But <laughs> More questions? I have a question. Maybe final question. Um, unless somebody else has more questions after this. 
Uh, should we expect uh, another film from Ken Loach? Yeah. I mean, uh, he said when he made James Hall, James Hall, he said it was his last film, but then he made, made Identity Blade. Identity Blade. So what should we expect now? Well, um, yeah, this is a very, very interesting question. Um, about six weeks before we shot Jimmy's Hall, Ken said to me at breakfast one day, he said, um, we, was, we were casting in, in Dublin, and, and he said to me, um, is it, is it too late to stop this film? And I said, yes, it's too late. We, we've had two people doing really difficult dancing classes. We've cast an entire troupe. We've, 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 we're halfway to building a hall, and, uh, and we've, we've written music. We, we can't possibly stop now. It's not to stop now. You have to make the film. So Jimmy's Hall was supposed to be our last film, but it was a much bigger film than we thought it was going to be. It sounded so simple on the page. It was just a big, you know, little film in a dance hall on a bog in Ireland. And we had to build everything, and it was period, it was a huge production, really. Um, and then I overheard Ken saying to Alex from E1, who was the distributor, uh, at, the, at the British premiere of Jimmy's Hall, he said, you know, I don't know if it's a strong enough film for me to go out on, I don't know if I can stop there, it's not, not really political enough. So, so then we made I, Daniel Blake, and, and we made I, Daniel Blake in such a way that it would be really easy for Ken to make it. Ken is now 81, and he, oh, he's got a, a brilliant brain, um, but, uh, he has had all sorts of physical problems over the years, and he's only got one eye that works, he's had various different illnesses, um, so, you know, we go around with him like, like, you're just hoping he's not going to fall over and injure himself or something terrible is going to happen. Um, so we made I, Daniel Blake, very simple, we shot it in, like, two flats and, and uh, the job centre and the offices, everything was within a two mile radius, it was really, everything was really close together, it was a very simple film with two main characters, so we thought this is a really easy one to do. Um, but another script from Paul Laverty arrived on my desk last week, <laughs> um, but we, we, we have been, we are cooking another one. I don't know if Ken will be able to do it, I don't know. Um, whether he'll have the energy to do it. The problem is, it requires such concentration, daily concentration to direct a film. And Ken isn't the sort of person who's going to sit behind a monitor. He doesn't like monitors. He, he runs around the set, whispering in the actor's ears. And he, he won't do, you know, if he does a film, he takes the whole thing on. And, We'll just have to wait and see. It's it's a very good script, so I hope so. <laughs> and I don't know if there's and, and the thing is I think the way to make Ken do it is to suggest one or two other people who might be good to direct it. <laughs> and then he'll think, Oh well maybe I should do it. <laughs> that's that's what producing is, is really easy. Yeah, yeah, let's hope he does it. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you. Thanks a lot for your masterclass for your Meeting today, meeting us today, and speaking about your experience. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me into this.